Shalom, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. Uh, my name is Josh Johnson from the Marketing and Programming Department at Nefesh for Nefesh. Uh, we are very happy to have you join us this evening, this afternoon. Um, uh, for a panel, we are happy to have with us Jeremy Lussman, Andrea Bernstein, Jack Jacobs, and Daniel Schwartz have all given their time to share with you their experiences here in Israel as attorneys. Um, they all have very different and unique paths to share. Uh, the session is being recorded along with all of our other sessions throughout the next month. This is our first content-oriented session of our Aliyah-inspired month. Some of you in New York and some of the other big cities in America might be used to our annual mega event that didn't happen last year, isn't happening this year. Um, and we're looking at about a 50-50 chance for next year. But um, we have replaced it with a month of, month of programming. Uh, today is the first day. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I am very pleased to have Jeremy Lussman as our moderator for this, this session. Um, again, the session is being recorded. If you do have any questions, please put them in the Q&A and we will address them as they come. Um, uh, we will not be using the raise your hand feature, um, but if you put anything in the Q&A, we will, we, will, we will do our best to reply as much as we can. Um, with that, I will pass to Jeremy. Thank you for being with us. Thanks, Josh. Uh, it's great uh, to see you, uh, uh, such a, an old close friend, and to be doing this uh, together with uh, Nefesh Menefesh and the amazing work that you guys do. Uh, we've all been beneficiaries, or most of us have been, been beneficiaries of Nefesh Menefesh uh, in, in a number of ways. And, you know, we're all touched by the amazing work that you guys do and being such a, a, a phenomenal resource for Olim uh, before uh, their arrival in Israel and, and certainly afterwards. Um, it's a real privilege uh, to be on this panel, to be moderating this panel together with a number of close friends, uh, Daniel Schwartz, Andrea Bernstein, uh, Bernstein and Jack Jacobs. Um, I'll introduce uh, each of them in a moment. Uh, and from our perspective, this is just an opportunity to have a short brief conversation to uh, give all of you who are watching uh, a short glimpse into uh, different career paths for lawyers in Israel. Thankfully, the number of career paths over the years uh, has really grown. There are a number of ways of being an attorney in Israel, a number of different pathways based on uh, experiences that we've all had uh, in the States. And, and each of us has taken a different path at, at getting where we are right now. And from our perspective, our goal is to just share some thoughts with you on how we've arrived where we are, but more importantly, to be there as a resource uh, for all of you uh, who are watching. And so we recognize this is a short, um, a short discussion. Uh, we're only gonna be on for about 40, 45 minutes, whatever it is, we're here to take questions at, at the end. And, and frankly, uh, as we all had follow up and uh, needing to be in touch and you know wanting to be a resource for all of you, uh, to the extent that you have questions, there are any touch points that we focus upon or anything else that you would like for us to discuss, either raise it in the Q&A or, uh, you know, you can reach out to us separately after uh, this is over. Uh, you know, we can all share uh, our contact information uh, with you and, uh, you know, would love to be uh, here as a resource in any possible way. So um, my name again is Jeremy Lustman. I'm a partner with DLA Piper, large international law firm. Um, I head up our Israel practice. Um, I've been with DLA for about 17 years, uh, practiced with the firm for about six years in the States, uh, graduated law school about 20 years ago. So three years with one firm, then six years in the States with DLA, and now uh, almost 12 years uh, here in Israel uh, for DLA. We made Aliyah uh, in the summer of 2009. Uh, my family and I, we live in Hashmonaim, uh, which is just outside of Modi'in. Um, for me, particularly uh, coming with DLA was a, a real blessing, uh, you know, that, that sort of was born out of a very challenging period of time uh, uh, in the global economy. We came in the summer of 2009 and in uh, September 2008, uh, was when the global financial crisis hit, when uh, Lehman fell, when uh, transactional lawyers, I'm a corporate M&A lawyer, transactional lawyers were really in the midst of a very, very challenging period of time in the States. And, uh, you know, our career paths was, was put very much uh, in jeopardy uh, during that period of time where a lot of firms were laying corporate 
associates off and the financial markets were completely dried up and there was no credit and it was a very, very uh, challenging time. At the same time, Israel was about to be admitted to the OECD. Uh, Israel was really weathering the storm um, in, a, in a very positive way relative to a lot of other countries, in, including the US. And DLA, my firm, as an organization was growing internationally, even though in the US we were having a challenging time, internationally we were growing. And so I had a unique opportunity in the midst of a very down market to throw out the possibility of an Israel practice uh, to the powers that be in the firm. I had been there already for six years at the time, and so I had strong relationships with management in Washington, D.C., where I was practicing, and uh, CEO of the firm was Jewish at the time, very pro-Israel, and, you know, really the stars aligned, and there was a lot of uh, hashkachan, you know, uh, uh, grace of God in terms of being able to throw out the possibility of an Israel practice, and one thing led to the next, and I was able to uh, uh, earn an opportunity to come here for a year on a trial basis, and then that got extended for a second year. And then thankfully, we had some positive traction in those first two years, which enabled us to institutionalize the practice and, and kind of build it out. So that, that's sort of my quick story in a nutshell. Um, you know, I'd love to introduce uh, our wonderful panelists. Uh, we have Andrea Bernstein, who's counsel at Schwell Wimfeimer and Associates. Andrea is uh, a real uh, guru. She has a wonderful name in the country as being really one of the go-to resources for labor and employment. She's been practicing for 18 years and she leads the practice uh, for labor and employment uh, at Schwell Wimfeimer. Uh, we have Daniel Schwartz, who is a partner at um, ABZ Law. Uh, Daniel uh, has many, many years of experience um, in the world of uh, family law, mediation, uh, 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 more specifically, but also more generally litigation. I had the privilege of meeting Daniel in his um, scouting days when he was looking at Aliyah, when he was considering the various possibilities, and he's, um, you know, a real source of inspiration uh, for me in terms of the path that, that he has followed. And uh, you know we'll we'll hear from Daniel shortly, and then Jack Jacobs. Jack is a managing partner at Clean Tech Law Partners. Uh, Jack's been in Israel for 20 years, longer than uh, all of us. Uh, he uh, just found out he's been had been based in Jerusalem, just moved to Efrat uh, very recently, and he has had also a very unique career path. He's uh, been a practicing lawyer. He's been focused in the world of uh, legal policy and business positions in the U.S. and abroad. Uh, he's been uh, associated with a law firm near Boston, near Boston, a clean tech venture firm in Jerusalem. He's had a lot of government experience, and so he really operates at the intersection of business, law, and policy uh, in the world of, of clean tech and environment. So uh, again, excited to welcome uh, uh, my friends to this panel, very much look forward to the conversation. Maybe I'll just ask each of you uh, to introduce yourselves, maybe talk uh, a few minutes about what you're doing, what your firm does, what your focus uh, is, and maybe just for a minute or two about uh, your career path. What were you doing in the States before you came here? What was sort of your vision uh, for practicing law? Um, you know, in advance of your Aliyah and, 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 you know, maybe just talk for a few minutes about your career path and then we'll go into some more detail. Uh, Andrea, why don't we start with you? You're on, you're on mute. I knew I was going to be muted when I started. Sorry. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so I'm going to be honest. I didn't plan for this. Um, I'm not living the dream. Um, nobody is more, because it was not my dream, nobody is more surprised than me, other than maybe my mother, that I live here now. Um, so I'm just going to back up a little bit and tell you my story. Um, I, I grew up, you know, you give money to Israel, you go to programs here, you visit, but you don't move here. Who does that? Um, that was kind of how I grew up. And um, I went off to college. I went to Emory for college. The summer between college and law school, I came to Israel for the summer. Nice place to visit. Um, but but that was it. Um, I went to law school at Harvard. And then after law school, I moved to New York and I was in the litigation department at Freed Frank. Um, I met my husband 
And um, while we were dating, he said, so what do you think about Aliyah? And I looked at him like he was crazy and said, I'm American, I'm a lawyer, I'm an American lawyer. Like, well, I don't speak Hebrew. What are you talking about? We're not making Aliyah. And he's like, can you just think about it? And I was like, no, I can't. And um, and and whatever, we got married anyway. Um, so that, that was nice. I guess it wasn't a deciding factor and it worked out that it wasn't. Um, um, I practiced in New York for about two and a half years. And then my husband and I, we moved to Boca and I joined Proskauer's Labor and Employment Practice where I ended up staying for a little over 10 years. Um, about a year after I moved to Boca, Rabbi Fast started Nefesh Benefesh about 10 houses down the street from me. Um, and even then I thought, wow, that's so beautiful. Why are those people leaving America? Like it's 30% that's beautiful, 70%. I don't even understand, like what? Um, and, and that really was my mindset. Like, that's beautiful, not for me. And then fast forward really a decade. And in 2013, um, I unfortunately heard that somebody had gone to law school that had passed away very young, about two, three weeks before Sukkot. And we've been planning to go to New York and go to Great Adventure. Oh, at this point, I had three kids. And I thought life's too short to spend, to take two weeks off from work to schlep around, like trying to find things to do with the kids in New York. We should take them to Israel for their first real trip. Um, and again, that's what it was, it was a vacation. Um, and really from the moment that we landed and I saw the country through the eyes of my children and we still joke that like we dropped our stuff off at the Airbnb and we went to Meisharim or Gula and one of the stores was selling fresh popcorn on the street and I said, hey guys, you want popcorn? And my kids were like, we can eat the popcorn here. And that was when I realized like, we were killing ourselves in America on a different schedule. Like I had to find backup childcare on Sukkot. And then on Christmas, my kids were in school and I was home. And it, it, there's a country here that was made for my Dati lifestyle and for my children. And that trip, just to see the country through their eyes. I went from a person who was like, we're going on vacation to we should make Aliyah. And I saw friends on Ben Yehud. I'm like, don't you guys want to move here? And they were like, no, focus nice. I'm like, okay. Um, so by the time we got on the plane going home, um, the thought was, if I could find a job here, then we move here. I'm kind of risk averse. Again, it wasn't the dream. I certainly hadn't made any plans to move here. Um, but I said, if I could find a job here, we'll consider it. And maybe that was my little hedge also thinking it would never happen. Um, and you talk about Ashkacha, you know, um, basically I went on to Google, like just like in the evenings, I'd Google like American employment lawyer in Israel. And I, after like doing that 20 times, I don't know what I did differently, but a hit came up of somebody. Um, and I turned to my husband, I go, this, I turned my laptop, I go, this woman, that's what I do in Israel. And he's like, yeah, that's so-and-so sister. And we should give her a call tomorrow. And, and fortunately she needed help and, um, and it worked out. And sometimes it just works out. I was fortunate enough to interview on my pilot trip um, and to know that I had a job before I made Aliyah. Let me tell you a little bit about my firm, Schwab and Feinman Associates. We are a firm um, made up of American Olim, practicing American law from Israel. There are some members of the firm who are admitted in Israel, but we, to the best of my knowledge, exclusively practice in the area of American law. My practice is, is particularly interesting, or I think particularly interesting, because not only do I represent the area of employment, tr firm, traditional US firm clients who need labor and employment advice, but I also advise Israeli companies that are hiring their first, second, 10th employee in America and really want to have US Employment Council that they can call at 10 a.m. on a Sunday morning, that they can call on a Monday morning, that they know, on, you know, I, I'm not, I'm certainly not a US, um, excuse me, an Israeli employment lawyer, but have some idea of where they're coming from and can provide advice to them um, from where they're coming from. So um, I feel like I've been incredibly fortunate um, to be able to do that. I've been there since I, since I made Aliyah, so it's about six and a half years now. And, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions, but that's, that's my Aliyah story. And sometimes I still turn to my husband and go, can you believe we moved? Can you believe we left America? But it's really, it's been the most amazing thing. And I look at my kids and I look at our life and, and, um, it's the best thing that ever happened, the decision to come on that vacation. And so for you, what you had, you had this trip and, the, you know, these, these amazing experiences over Sukkot and then kind of getting into career mode and thinking through the options in these Google searches and coming across, right, the hit that ended up turning into an opportunity. Was that, did you sort of put that on hold for a couple of months or was that kind of a October, November, December? Well, we made Aliyah that August. So, um, 
it was sort of, I would think by December. Um, and we came on our pilot trip in March. So, okay. um, so I mean, but again, like I feel, I feel like lucky that I found, um, you know, that opportunity here. But, um, but I think other people on the panel will also tell you, like, once you're here, you also see that from job boards and postings and things that, you know, that there are, that there are opportunities also once you're here, you know, people use the phrase, you know, sometimes if you want to come here, you have to reinvent yourself or what have you, you know, again, I've been fortunate enough to be able to do what I've been doing, but um, the, the entire time frame was very compressed from that uh, trip to Aliyah was sure. eight months. Yeah, nine yeah months. for sure. Jack, why don't we uh, turn it over to you and hear, hear a little bit about your story? Yeah, sure, no problem. Thanks for having me and, uh, and for the introduction. Um, it was so interesting to listen to your, to your story, Andrea. I think a lot of um, a similarities in the sense of just sort of the connection to the place, but definitely not in my, in my job path. <laughs> um, I've had a lot um, since I've been here. I, I, I came here for the first time um, when I was 17 on one of these summer trips. Um, I was just totally blown away because, you know, I grew up in a place that there weren't very many Jews. And so it was, uh, it was, it was an amazing sort of eye-opening experience to see a place where the trash man was Jewish and it sort of blew me away for the rest of my life. Um, and so the second I came back from that summer, I just basically planned the next return. And that was Hebrew year for my junior year. Uh, I spent the year, again, just sort of, uh, in that same sort of uh, awe <laughs> for an entire year of just floating through the country and learning and just being, you know, really, really felt like I was in my element. Um, the year went by too quickly. Um, I had to go back and finish my degree um, in, in the States, um, which for me meant reapplying to school because I had to drop out of college because my school didn't have a, a, a some a study abroad program. So I had to, I had to, drop out and then reapply in order to do a, a summer, a, a year away. So anyway, uh, I finished my degree um, and a few days later came back to Israel um, with, on a fellowship with a, an organization in Tel Aviv that did environmental activism, environmental law, um, called Adam Teva Vadin. It's sort of like the, the NRDC of, of Israel. Um, and that experience really solidified for me a, a career path as opposed to an Aliyah path. Um, sort of, Aliyah was kind of a, a given from the second I was here, <laughs> but, um, but career-wise, you know, I, I didn't know, I was still in, in, the, in, the, in the formulation of, of what, what my career path was going to be. Um, so being in an organization in Israel that was doing kind of exactly what I wanted to be doing in, in, my, in my career life um, was, was really a, a, a solidifying experience. So while I was in Tel Aviv that year um, on this fellowship, um, I applied to law school uh, and I got in and, and uh, decided that I was going to focus on environmental law at Vermont Law School. I went there from 1997 till 2000. Um, and the second I graduated law school, I had a job offer near Boston. And for me, I thought, you know, okay, so Ali, I can wait a little bit and, you know, I, make a little bit of money and, and do the thing that, that people always say, which is, which is, you know, bring a little bit with you so you have a little bit of a, of a cushion. And so I started, I started working and, um, and I started feeling comfortable in my life and, and in my career and I, and I was enjoying it. And, and, you know, it was my first job out of law school and my first real ability to, to earn a living. And that comfort sort of made me a little bit discomfort discomfortable um, because I thought that, you know, if I, if I kept this up, then it was going to be, it was going to be much more difficult to leave and to make up. Yeah. And so I just quit one day and I said, okay, if I'm going to do this, I have to just do this. And so I quit my job um, and I made a yeah. That was 2001, uh, almost 20 years ago next month. Um, and it was definitely one of the best decisions that I've ever made in my life. I'm, I'm kind of a, I wouldn't say I'm the most decisive person, but one, that was really the decision that, that, that was not, not difficult and, and, and definitely um, uh, one of the better things that I've ever, ever done. So, so this is when uh, you know, my, my, my career path sort of takes a, an interesting and maybe windy road. Um, I, from the time I got here, I, I also managed to, uh, before I made Aliyah, 
I managed to connect with an environmental lawyer who I thought was going to be, you know, the, the top of, of my career. And I would, you know, just settle into a job of, uh, that, that I had dreamed about. But it turned out that he was kind of an anti-environmental lawyer. <laughs> and so, so all this idealism that, that, I, that I had coming into this job um, was, was kind of vanished pretty quickly when I realized that instead of representing, um, instead, of, instead of helping the, the, the environment, I was you know, being asked to represent industry and, and some pretty intense uh, um, clients. Um, so anyway, needless to say, I didn't last long at that job. <laughs> Um, and I moved on to do a variety of things. Uh, I, I worked with a, a professor uh, who was also a lawyer at Hebrew U to write a book about environmental law. I did my stage at the Ministry of the Environment, which was also an amazing experience, both professionally in terms of learning about what the, um, what the practice of law in Israel is all about and policy and, and some of, you know, how the government works, but also culturally you know, to be in a, in a an environment where you know you're with real Israelis. You're not just with the Anglo bubble, um, and to and to sort of really be a, a part of society, I think was a, was a was an amazing experience. Similarly, maybe in in in, in a similar way to being in the army, because you're really in it. You're really part of of Israeli society. Um, after that, I worked for a, a big law firm in Tel Aviv, uh, uh, one of the the top three at the time. Um, and I also taught. I taught a course in environmental law at the, at the Arava Institute uh, for Environmental Studies in, in the uh, Arava Desert. And so at that point, I decided that I needed a little bit of sabbatical. Um, uh, and I decided to take a year off and get my LLM back in the US. Um, and I went to Lewis and Clark in Portland um, and I focused on how renewable energy could be used as a tool to help uh, sorry, how the law could be used as a tool to help grow the renewable energy industry. Um, and from that experience, um, I, I sort of um, got a, an idea in my brain that maybe there was a need for, for a boutique firm that was focused on renewable energy and clean tech um, and poked around in the industry to see if such a thing existed and it didn't. So I took that as a sign that, that the world needed a law firm that was focused on renewable energy and, and clean tech companies. And, and so I started a firm called Clean Tech Law Partners um, in 2009, and I've been managing it and running it and, and, and working um, virtually uh, in Israel for, for all of this time. So that's a very short version of a, of a long path. And you're, 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 it's a virtual firm, but the, the focus of your work and your clients is more Israel centered? Is it more US centered? What sort of the split of no, kind of? I'd say 95% uh, of our clients are in the US. Another four are, are in Europe and, and the rest of the world and, and maybe 1% are in Israel. But the vast majority of, of my work is, is in the US. And I should just maybe just add uh, a point there that it's, it's super easy to work virtually. Uh, even before all of this crazy pandemic stuff happened, um, the technology that we have now, I mean, most of my clients for probably all of this time, I would say the vast majority of them don't know that I'm here. Um, and so, and, it, and it's seamless. I mean, my phone rings, my US phone number rings on my Israeli cell phone and, you know, and my emails work the same. Sometimes, you know, I, they get emails from me at three o'clock in the morning and they think I'm just crazy, <laughs> you know, staying up all night. But, um, but for the most part, it's a, it's a, it's a seamless, seamless practice that's great and it's fascinating because you've you and, and this is a great segue into daniel but you you went through the israeli system in terms of doing stage and exploring the practice of policy and law in israel but yeah. through that you know in your education in the states your your client work and your experiences you know sort of took a, the majority of of what you're doing outside of israel yeah. Uh, um, uh, whereas Daniel, and it's, it's, it's a great introduction to you, Daniel came from the States, obviously you um, elected to go through the Israeli system head on and you're very much practicing in a world where your clients are here in Israel and you're focused on Israeli practice. Well, maybe, maybe tell us a little bit about your story, your, 
uh, trajectory. We'd love to hear hear kind of where you are. Sure. Thank you very much. I'm sort of like at both Andrea um, and Jack, and, and then different. Um, the main difference that I have professionally is that unlike the two of them, I never came from a background in big law. Um, I was always a, I was a solo practitioner for a number of years and after 9-11 because of the way the, uh, the economy got hit in New York, I wanted to join um, a firm and then I moved to a second firm before making the LEF. I got admitted to the bar in 1995 in New York and I practiced almost exclusively uh, matrimonial um, and family law, uh, primarily in the Orthodox and in the, Ameri in, in the New York uh, Haredi communities. Um, did a lot of work before the Bakhtin Din Rovaniim um, in New York um, as well, uh, because that's where a lot of the action uh, took place. Um, like Andrea, I never intended really to make Aliyah. We never thought we were going to make Aliyah. When my wife and I were dating, I think maybe one of us asked the other one if we ever gave any thought to Aliyah. We said, yeah, it's a nice concept, but no. Um, then when our oldest son was about 15 years old, for a lot of different reasons, um, we just took stock of our life, and we decided that for a lot of a, a lot of personal reasons, we had to make some some changes. Um, you know, in the way we were living, and Aliyah turned out to be the most logical choice to make. Uh, so in January of 2017, my wife and I took a pilot trip. It was 2016, sorry, my wife and I took a pilot trip to Israel. Uh, Jeremy, that's when you and I uh, met via a common friend. We had a wonderful breakfast together at the Big Up. Outside of the outside freshman game. Um, and in August of 2016, at the ripe old age of 46, after practicing law for 21 years in the United States, I made Aliyah. Because I didn't come from that kind of a big law, you know, background, I didn't have a specialty which travels internationally very well. Um, I knew that I'm ending a career in the United States. There was no option for me to be able to practice law in Israel um, and service um, divorce clients essentially in the United States. Um, it's a very, very client involvement uh, practice. Clients want their divorce lawyer at their beck and call. Um, they would have never tolerated a seven-hour time difference and things like that. Plus, court appearances would have been, you know, also impossible. So I knew I'll be starting over completely. Um, I gave serious thought to leaving law completely uh, when I made Aliyah. I figured 21 years is a nice run. If I'm starting life, starting over again, I'll do something else. The problem was when I interviewed um, for a number of different non-legal positions, either in the public sector, you know, in foundation work, or in the private sector, um, I was told by many people that if I don't get admitted to the bar in Israel, it's going to be taken as a strike against me. To the extent that people would think that perhaps I got disbarred in the United States and therefore not eligible for licensure in Israel, and therefore I was told by many people, or at least enough people, that I take it seriously that I need to get admitted to the bar. So. I started to study for the bar um, in Israel. Um, I did my, my stage, or you know, more commonly referred to now, um, at a cousin's law firm in Estiona. Only time professionally was something that actually went really easy for me in terms of having uh, protectia and having the connections to do it. Um, but I did that, um, and then I got admitted uh, to the bar. Um, job opportunities again, because at 47 years old, reinventing yourself completely in, in Profession, you know, the joke is I'm, I'm a 15, I'm a 28 year old lawyer in a 51 year old body, um, which is, you know, is really what it is. Um, I was lucky though. My partner uh, was my partner who made Aliyah right after right out of college, out of YU. He and I were friends from YU. He was looking to open up um, an office on his own. He was in house uh, to a pharma a pharma pharmaceutical corporation. He was looking to leave that and take them as a as an anchor client and start a uh, start his own practice. And he invited me to come in as his partner. Um, I really didn't want to do that. I didn't want to do business for myself. And then he called me up with an extremely juicy litigation matter, which I can't talk about because it's still under seal. But based upon that matter, which was enticing enough. We said, fine, let's get it going. That was in 2018, right after I got admitted to the bar here. And since then, I'm essentially an American lawyer practicing Israeli law. I do Israeli litigation. I became certified as a mediator and an arbitrator in Israel. I'm always happy to take on that kind of work. And um, 
the other, the other aspect of what I do is some consulting for private clients, American private clients who have legal issues um, in Israel generally you know, dealing with, um, with trusts and estates or inheritance matters um, and, and things like that. And I'm still in the process uh, of, of inventing myself as an Israeli lawyer. I mean, it's, it's a never ending process. And, uh, you know, that's where we are. It's great. It's, I mean, it's fascinating and, and really interesting because, you know, where you were coming from and where I came from, I, I received the exact opposite advice in terms of becoming an Israeli lawyer. Because from where I was coming from, from a big international firm, where my goal was to create a client base in Israel, but to help Israeli clients navigate internationally. Um, what I was told was that if I became a local Israeli lawyer, then Israeli law firms who potentially would become, and, and thankfully that ended up happening, but who could become a strong referral source for me would look at me as an Israeli lawyer as a potential competitor. And so I was like Dafka, you know, out there in the market very much, listen, I am not an Israeli lawyer. I am not taking the Israeli bar. I am not here to take any of your local Israeli business, we're just looking to be a resource to help navigate your clients around the world. So, I mean, I just think it, it speaks to the fact that we're all on this panel. There's so many different ways of coming into the market. Each one has its pros and its cons um, and, and, and its challenges for sure. Um, and, you know, and, 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 and unlike where we came from, where I feel like we, we sort of slotted into okay, we, we either decided to go into a big firm or a small firm or more of a policy oriented role, you know, but I, I feel like our paths were somewhat carved out for us based on what our interests were, as opposed to coming to Israel, where you really have to, like, like Andrea said, you really have to consider how you're going to invent, reinvent yourself. Okay, there are a few ways where maybe you could continue in a similar type of a role, but for all of us, we had to kind of figure out, okay, is it a matter of, uh, are we gonna be out there in the market or are we gonna be working remotely, you know, back to the US? Do we wanna have more of an Israeli focus or more of a, you know, uh, an international focus? And again, every, every uh, career path has its, has its ups and downs and challenges. Um, I would say, you know, may, maybe, maybe I could just ask each of you, it looks like we have a number of questions that have come through the chat and I think it will be most beneficial just to start um, addressing them and answering those questions in real time. But maybe just, you know, obviously we have 50, 60 uh, uh, potential OLIM who are on the line, you know, all of whom presumably are in the legal field and, and are considering their pathways. What, what piece of advice would you give them? What types of, you know, what are things that they could be doing while they're in the States right now to set themselves up uh, uh, for success when they come and, you know, and just maybe a piece or two of advice. Again, obviously uh, the, the participants will reach out to each of us, uh, you know, to I'm sure with their own individual questions, but I think for them to hear words of encouragement, words of advice, words of caution, maybe each of you can just chime in. Why don't we start uh, Jack with you on that one? I think that I think that um, when it really comes down to it, if it's something that you you have an, an inkling to do, if it's if it's uh, something that's been eating at you, that this is the right place to live and this is the right place to raise a family and this is the right place for yourself, then you just have to do it. I mean, it's like like a lot of other things in life, you you, you get to a point in a decision where you just have to take a step and fall off the cliff and hope for the best. And in all of our cases, and, and you know, many people, I think the vast majority um, can attest to the fact that it was, was a great decision. And, and it's an amazing place to live. It's an amazing place to, to raise kids and, and, and a family and to, and to just spend a life. It's an amazing headquarters. That being said, once you're here, it's not like they clip your wings and take your passport at the airport. I mean, you're able to come and go as you please. This is not North Korea. I mean, it, it, it's worth a shot. It's worth, a, it's worth an attempt if it, if it's if it's something that, that that you have inside of yourself, and you know it's going to be great. <laughs> um, and if it's not, then you you take a you take a break, or you or you you know you can you can change you 
can change paths, but no, nothing is set in stone. This is not a communist regime. Regime. It's a. It's an amazing place to live. So, you feel the ability. I, I agree with you. I, I certainly agree with you on the personal front, and you know, for, for for all of those reasons and more, why we moved here, and you know, all of the advantages. I would say, from a career perspective, obviously, with people kind of thinking about, okay, what are the upsides? What are the, what's the downside risk? What if things don't work out? As I as I hoped, and and I think for a number of us that happened, right? Things didn't necessarily work out exactly as we planned, you know. And at different points, we had to sort of retool. Is it more kind of along the lines of what Andrea was saying, and just sort of you know the ability to reinvent yourself here um, allows for more creativity, allows for sort of moving into different types of roles. Like how do you, Jack, you know, kind of answer that point of managing the down risk of picking up from a career in the States, you know, and, and sort of reinventing yourself here. Yeah, I think that there's a lot of opportunity here too. I think there's an a lot of opportunity to, to, to sort of advance at a faster rate maybe than other places in the world because Israel is such a small place still. And, you know, and to get into the kind of positions that, that, that you it might take 50 years to get into a, a managerial position in a, in, even in government you know, or, or a policy position. Or, I mean, it, it could just take a few in Israel because it's, it's, it's sort of like a smaller, smaller pool and you're able to make that much more of an impact in a smaller pool than you are in a giant ocean. And so I think in that perspective also, it's, a, it's an amazing career place. Um, and, and just, you know, another just small point about, uh, about the, the career potential. I think the fact that we all speak English as a first language, I, I think is still not something that should be taken for granted. I mean, most of the positions that I've had, I, I've had here have been, you know, obviously because I'm an American lawyer and, you know, there, there was a legal position, but I think that, that, that it still holds a lot of weight that, that we speak English as a first language. And I think that should bring a lot of confidence to, to everyone on the call that that, you know, coming here, it's, it can maybe be a little bit scary because, you know, I don't speak Hebrew, I don't know, I don't, I'm not a practicing Israeli lawyer, I don't, you know, how am I going to pass the bar and all of these like crazy questions that can make you neurotic and crazy, but there's a lot of advantages that, and a lot of uh, positive qualities that you bring just by being an American lawyer in Israel, and I think that that has a lot of value for a lot of employers that, that, um, that, that maybe shouldn't be forgotten. 100%. Yeah, I would just, uh, just to respond to that, just three quick thoughts that, that, that came into my mind when you were speaking. One, I think we would all agree that in America, you know, we probably often say it to people that we're talking to, but in America, there's an idea of, you know, five or six degrees of separation, whereas in Israel, it's much more like one to two degrees of separation, right? The ability for us to meet people, to get in front of people, to be connected to people is a much smaller world that I think works for most of us to, to our advantage. Um, that's one. Number number two, and Jack, you were touching upon this, the, the typical age of executives in Israel is much younger than it is in the States because it's such a technology-driven market and you have you know so many post-army uh, folks that are going into companies, uh, creating technologies. You know, you, you end up I end up seeing general counsels and, and you know, I'd be curious uh, for Andrea's view, but you know, in America, I feel like the typical GC is you know, mid forties to 60. Whereas in Israel, I feel like the typical GC is more 35 to 55. You know? So the ability to, and 55 is kind of on the older side. You know, it's, it's more, I would say, more probably 40 to 50-ish. Um, where, where you see senior people in, in legal positions within companies. So I think that's the second point. And the, the third point um, is that, you know, along the lines of is being an American a handicap or is it an advantage? And I think kind of along the lines of what Jack was saying that when, you know, when you first came, you know, you wanted to sort of jump into the deep end as an Israeli and be with Israelis, uh, you know, and sort of follow that path. And obviously Daniel followed a similar path in terms of taking the Israeli bar. For me, you know, I kind of got to a point and, you know, I, I came to Israel when I was in my mid to late thirties. And, you know, I, I knew that I was never going to be an Israeli. As much as I was going to try to be an Israeli, everyone would always identify me as, as an American. And I think with time, I think actually the mm -hmm. mazel ended up working 
in our favor where so many Israeli companies became more global. So many Israeli companies established branches in America, in Europe, and English was a pre, you know, speaking English well was a premium. Being a non-Israeli and making Aliyah and saying to Israelis, hey, listen, we made Aliyah, we made a commitment, we came with our family. You know, it's not easy to reinvent yourself and start fresh at whatever age we came, you know, but we can provide advantage to you. We could provide, you know, a level of quality and service and attention, et cetera, that could be beneficial to your companies, et cetera. So I think just sort of thinking about being an American, Ole, not, in a, not as a, a handicap per se, but trying to leverage it and using it as, using it as an advantage. Daniel, let, let's turn to you. What, 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 what guidance would you provide potential Olim? So if you're intending to take the Israeli bar and get admitted to the bar in Israel, one word, Hebrew. You must become proficient in the Hebrew language and start preparing for it before you make Aliyah. Um, for example, one thing that I did before I made Aliyah was I set my ways to Hebrew just to get used to hearing Hebrew spoken in everyday tasks and getting directions um, to places. I went on to YouTube and I started watching Eretz Nehederet and Hayyudim Bayim. Um, and I also watched the first uh, season of Shtisel before everybody in America was, was raving about, about Shtisel. Get used to hearing and speaking Hebrew as much as you possibly can. If you're going to take the Israeli bar exam, um, and there was a question about how the bar exam is structured here, which I'm going to get to in a minute. Um, certainly, I would say in the Dine Yisrael portion, again, which I'll explain what that is, 40% of your success in taking the exam is, is simply being able to read and understand the statutes and, there, and also write your answers um, on the exam. Um, and then, if you're going to if you're going to start to practice Israeli law, obviously, you know you have to you have to know Hebrew. At the same time, Israelis are very very understanding, in my experience at least, of Americans um, who speak Hebrew uh, or, or, or who try to speak Hebrew. Uh, my wife is the best example of that because we've been here almost for five, for almost five years. Um, she's absolutely fearless. She'll speak. She'll start to speak Hebrew, and she knows that she makes mistakes, especially with Zachar and Nekeva, like all Americans do, because English is not a gendered language. She's absolutely fearless about it. She works in uh, cardiac research at the um, one of the local hospitals in Kaplan Hospital, and the Israelis they smile and they correct it, but everybody loves her for it. I go to court. I make mistakes sometimes uh, in Hebrew. I started my first trial um, just this past Monday, um, and again the judges. They're understanding of it, but everybody appreciates the effort. But if you want to succeed at the exam, you absolutely have to speak Hebrew. Um, I just want to take a second and describe the Israeli bar exam. If you come to Israel uh, with five years of experience outside of Israel, you have to then take a series of exams that are called the Bechinot Dine Yisrael, uh, which are eight exams plus a Hebrew proficiency exam. The eight exams in substance of law cover about 30 different statutes. Uh, corporate law formation and dissolution of corporations, some tax, uh, bankruptcy, uh, personal as well as corporate uh, bankruptcy or dissolution as it's called here, criminal law, um, tort law, labor law, contracts, uh, matrimonial law, inheritance law, um, and then there are a few others that I'm, that I'm not remembering um, I, as well. You have to take that, and plus, uh, as I said, as I said as well, you have to do a, um, a Hebrew proficiency exam. If you don't have five years of experience outside of Israel, you have to do that, and then you have to take the Israeli bar exam as well. And that exam is becoming more and more of a nightmare in Israel, even for graduates of Israeli law schools. And um, so, so therefore, there's an advantage if you practice law for five years before you come to Israel, because you'll save yourself one very, very difficult exam. After you take whatever, after you take the Dine Yisrael exams, you then have to do a stage, um, which is officially 18 months, but they, there is discretion at the Israeli Bar Association to lower it down to as little as six months. Mine was lowered down to nine months. My understanding is they never really go, they never go lower than nine months. Um, and then after that, after you take, the, after you pass the exams, you do your hitmachut. You go to a very interesting ceremony. Um, in Jerusalem, and uh, 
you get your license. Um, as opposed to the United States, attendance at the ceremony is also compulsory. And, uh, and then you go out. But my, bet, my first and my, the most important piece of advice I would give you generally about making Aliyah, but especially in the legal profession, is the more Hebrew you know, the more effort you make to learn the language and to know the language, um, the better off you'll be. Yes, English is absolutely an advantage. Even for me, I'm practicing Israeli law. Proficiency in English obviously is, is very helpful. Um, but you're not going to escape the fact that you're living in Israel. And the more Hebrew you know, the easier the time of it you'll have. Great. Thanks, Daniel. Andrea? Sure. Um, so on the advice piece, um, I don't know if this is the opposite of reinvent yourself. If you don't want to reinvent yourself, um, really think outside. I don't know if thinking that far outside the box, but outside the box in terms of what you can do. I very much came from a background of you go to law school, you apply to a law firm, you move, you go to a different law firm. And then when you're ready to leave a big law firm, you go to a smaller law firm. And so when I came to look for jobs in Israel, my thought was look for a law firm. Um, since I've been here, though, just to, I, I've seen what other people have done. And just to give you some ideas, um, I know somebody who came, but before, when he was deciding to make Aliyah, he said to his Florida firm, here's what I want to do. Can I keep working for you, even though I'm sitting in Israel? So he's still working for the same firm. And they don't care if he's sitting in Miami. I, I guess they don't care if he's sitting in Miami or sitting in Israel. I know a woman who was doing, um, she was in the corporate department of Wild Gachel. She came here, shook the Israeli bar. And now she is a successful trust and estates and family lawyer um, in Renana, which is completely reinventing yourself. Um, I know somebody who the last I heard, um, he, had, he was doing for a big Israeli firm what he had done in America, but basically he had become their in-house US expert on, on his area of law, but he found a way to make it work in an Israeli firm, especially to the extent that Israeli firms have clients who are moving into the American market and can use American trained lawyers, there are possibilities. And then there's also, there's American firms who have opened offices here um, that if you have a practice, especially if you have a portable practice, there may be a place <coughs> you know, to, sit your, to sit yourself down within their practice. You know. So also thinking ahead, you know, if you're a brand new lawyer and you know you wanna make Aliyah in the next 10 years, becoming a prosecutor or a criminal defense attorney probably isn't the way to go. Um, because it's not so portable to Israel. Although I do know a woman in Afrat who I think for a decade now or so has continued a criminal defense practice in the US, but that involves a lot of travel. So think about what kind of practices you can build up in America um, that don't matter where, you know, that where it doesn't matter where you're sitting. Um, but think about the possibilities outside of just, okay, I'll move to um, a law firm in America. Um, as long as Daniel talked about the Israeli bar piece, I saw there are a few questions. Is it okay if I jump into just the foreign lawyer issue? Because I think it's related. Yes, yeah, um, So I'm admitted in Israel as a, I think it's called a foreign lawyer. Um, before, so maybe somebody else in the panel can speak to what it was like. But my understanding is, is that before I got here, uh, before I made Aliyah, you couldn't advise, maybe Jeremy, you can confirm this. Somebody who wasn't admitted in Israel couldn't advise Israeli clients even on US law, that's my understanding. You couldn't sit in Israel. And so people who came before 2011, 12 really had no choice, I think, except to um, pass the Israeli bar if they wanted to advise clients. Um, since I think 11, 12, there's this concept of an Israeli foreign lawyer. You take an ethics exam, which is best comparable to the MPRE um, on the Israeli ethics rules. You pay a monthly, I'm sorry, an annual fee. Jeremy, I don't know if, are you admitted as a foreign lawyer? Is there anything else to it? Right. I think it's just yeah, like, um, there's, the MPRE. And there's, the right, there's an annual fee and there's uh, like an insurance policy. Okay. And you get a little card that says you're an Israeli foreign lawyer. And that enables you to um, advise Israeli clients on, I believe the law is written as the, the law of the country where you're admitted um, or something to that effect. Um, but I think somebody in the Q&A had said, can you just advise Israeli clients on the law of where you're admitted? And I, I don't believe that you can. Obviously, the Israeli bar can provide better advice on that. But that's how you could practice Israeli law from here is get admitted. I'm sorry, American law for Israeli clients while you're you're in Israel. But there were a few questions about that, so I just wanted to right. If you're that. if you if you are an if if you are an American lawyer in Israel and you want to provide the guidance yourself while you're sitting in Israel. So exactly as Andrea was saying, we need to take the exam uh, to become a foreign qualified lawyer um, uh, in Israel. And that gives us the ability not to 
uh, advise on Israeli law issues, that's, that, that's the bar that the much harder route uh, in terms of exams, et cetera, that Jack and, and Daniel took. But from, from our perspective, what Andrea and I did is we took the lighter exam to become a foreign qualified lawyer in Israel. That in allowed English. Us in in English. English. That's right, in English. <laughs> um, in order to Very answer, important. <laughs> in order to answer <laughs> questions in Israel, uh, in Israel, but nothing, you, you don't have to, if you're working on behalf of your firm here more as a representative and the ultimate work is going to be advised back in America, for that specifically, you don't necessarily need to be a foreign qualified lawyer. But, you know, it, it, it's such an easy, relatively, it's such an easy exam to take and it's an easy qualification to have. So if you kind of want to go that route, um, I, I would definitely think, and I think Andrew would agree that that it's sensible. But I think one one just general point that I would make is that um, you know, and, and I'm, we're talking very openly and honestly. This there there are, there are challenges in whatever path uh, you, you all decide to take. But in in terms of the twelve years that I've been here, I have never seen a better market for Olim coming to Israel and considering various paths. When I came twelve years ago, there were the the doors were much smaller in terms of what a foreign lawyer could do in Israel. And now I just feel that between Israeli law firms looking for Anglo talent, whether you have the Israeli bar or not, and, and finding a lot of value, there are a lot more Anglos, Olim, that are getting jobs in big law firms here. There are a number, a growing number of Israeli unicorns, you know, huge number, the largest ever of, of Israeli technology companies that have raised hundreds of millions of dollars. With that money, many of them are increasing their legal department, both in Israel and frankly, in the States. And so for people who are considering Aliyah, one, one path that never was uh, available for me is find, is find an Israeli company with a, a significant presence in the States, New York, California, et cetera. And there are opportunities to potentially get in-house uh, in those companies before you make Aliyah, and then it's certainly an easier pathway. Uh, you could, you, um, you know, and 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 obviously there are there are the possibilities of opening a branch for your firm in Israel, et cetera. But um, you know, those 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 present opportunity, but they also pose a lot of challenges for firms who don't want to trip up tax issues um, and the like in terms of what they're going to be subject to in Israel. And then the last point is that I think COVID. Has definitely what 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 uh, the panelists have been saying is COVID has definitely opened up a lot more possibilities. Firms that three four years ago never would have uh, uh, given uh, an associate a partner from the states license to come and work abroad. You know the fact that we've all been in this situation for more than than the last year. You know I think has made firms rethink that possibility and say, listen, if this is a valuable asset and resource for our firm, we want to keep this person and they're moving to Israel. And, you know, I've definitely seen more people with stories that, you know, are, are that have allowed them to at least try out for a year or potentially two years a practice on behalf of their firm or working remotely on behalf of their firm. So um, I would definitely, you know, there's what to be cautious about, but there's also a lot to be encouraged about. Um, okay, let's, why don't we take, I think we only have five, 10 minutes left. Why don't we Take a quick look at the Q and A. I know we addressed some of these questions, um, but I'll just sort of pick uh, some points and then I'll, I'll turn to the different panelists. Um, any experiences or tips to share for working in house in Israel? I, you know, I think I just touched upon that. I think again, there's an opportunity to work in house for an Israeli company in the states, but I, I don't have any specific experiences uh, or tips. Um, I think Daniel's point of being able to be um, to be conversant in Hebrew is is a is a positive. Most Israeli companies obviously have uh, a larger number of Hebrew speakers, so if you're working in the company, uh, brushing up on your Hebrew, I think is a is a is a is a plus there. I don't know if anyone else uh, on the panel has any. Andrea, I know you work with a lot of you know in-house lawyers here, and you have a lot of clients. Any any thoughts on? you know, someone who wants to work in-house, um, you know, anything that you would suggest for them? I've actually been surprised by how many positions seem to not require 
Um, I would, it seems like they're looking for, I, I, I don't, I, I don't know specifically so many people who are in in-house positions, but I know that I've seen um, job postings for things and, and it doesn't necessarily require Israeli bar admission. It seems like they're looking for more skills than, um, than specific admissions. And again, I, the Nevis Benevis job boards, the, um, I'm sure that um, after this, somebody can post other places where job listings are. I know that there's a Facebook group looking for foreign lawyers. Uh, I think it's foreign lawyers on Facebook where um, recruiters are posting potential positions for U.S. attorneys who are living in Israel. So I think just keep your eyes open. I, th I think that there's opportunity. Um, I, it's not a path that I ever went down, so I can't necessarily speak as well right. to it as I, as I can to the firm path. Um, there's a question about opportunity for someone who is right out of law school, um, as opposed to having, you know, a couple of years of experience under your belt before you move here, you know, is, are, are there opportunities for someone who is right out of law, law school? My, my specific uh, reaction to that is that the more experience that you have in the States, you know, the more of a selling point you have to the legal market in Israel. Um, so on one hand, I think you're position better, but on the other hand, you know, there's so much mazel and there's so much with respect to timing. And I've seen also a number of people that have come straight out of uh, school or maybe a year later and have found, you know, opportunities here. But um, why don't we, Jack, you want to chime in on that? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I did that. Um, I, I, you know, that, that first job that I mentioned was, was less than a year out of law school. I was actually sworn in to the Massachusetts bar by the U.S. consulate <laughs> in Jerusalem. So, you know, I was, I was pretty fresh off the, the boat and, and fresh out of law school. Um, and I, I think this, my, my sentiment for it all is the sooner the better. I mean, the sooner you can come and establish yourself either as an Israeli lawyer or an American lawyer in Israel, the better. I mean, it's just, it's just the, the sooner the better. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Daniel. I'll just also add, never mind professionally, although we're focused on the profession um, in this uh, conversation. I think coming to Israel when you're younger um, is just generally an easier thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if you're if you're fresh out if you're fresh out of school, you don't necessarily have big responsibilities, uh, you know, where you live or big commitments. Yeah, take take the plunge now because the older you get, it just becomes more complicated. Because the older you get, the more complicated your life will be, to, no matter where you live. So yeah. And I'll just I'll just add one more point too to that to that idea which is that exactly what, what uh, Daniel just said, is that there's a lot more flexibility when you're, when you're younger out of school. You have a lot more nimbleness in terms, of, in terms of the direction that your career will go instead of, you know, if you've been practicing the same kind of law for the last 50 years, then, you know, there's not, not much other, not many other, other zigzags you could make. Tell me about it. Whereas, what? Tell me about it. <laughs> no, I'm not. It's not meant as a criticism at all. Rather, no, rather no, so, you're right. You're right. It's absolutely no, true. No, I'm just saying it. You know, someone who's who, who has a, a a blank slate has a, a lot more colors that they can throw onto that that canvas. So, you know, there's a lot more flexibility that, that can be can be had. I would say for someone who is is planning to come, I I agree with both of you. The earlier that you can come, the better. And and I think you you are more nimble as a younger lawyer and, you know, you, you have more of an open mind. And so as long as you're coming, not expecting sort of, okay, in America, I would definitely go into a big firm, a mid-sized firm, a small firm coming to Israel, you have to be open to, to different possibilities. But, um, you know, I would say that, um, you know, to the extent that you can uh, have some type of summer associate position um, you know, and kind of build up some experience even during law school um, in the States to the extent that you have an opportunity if, you, if you're planning to come right after you graduate or soon after, if you have an opportunity to work during your third year of law school, um, you know, and, and sort of um, structure your classes in a way that gives you a day or two or part-time opportunities to intern, either with uh, you know, either with an organization or a high tech company, you know, again, even for free, I think the idea of trying to build experience and, and it allows you to show an Israeli firm or a company that you're coming right after law school, but here's what you've done even during law school to try and gain some experience. I think whatever could, you could do to set yourself, yourself up is, um, is helpful. 
Um, there's a question about the difficulty of communicating with U.S. clients um, from Thursday night U.S. time through Monday night Israeli time. Um, you know, um, maybe I'll 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 ask Jack to yeah. chime in there. Um, you know, and, and Andrea, I know you both uh, are dealing with with U.S. clients. Maybe you each can chime in, and then I'll give you my my yeah. thoughts as well. Yeah, sure. I actually just answered a similar one just now in the answer column, but um, yeah. I'll, all of my, for, for a long time, uh, I was staying up so late because I was afraid to say, no, I can't make a call at that time. You know, so I, would, I was up at the craziest hours. <laughs> and, then, and then, you know, I, I realized that I can just say, no, I, I, can, I can talk at 11 a.m. Pacific time instead of, you know, 3 p.m. And I can say that, and, you know, my, I can just say, I, you know, if we can do it at noon, that would be better for me. And then people are just like, okay, so fine. So you have a call at noon, which is 10 p.m. here in California time or whatever, or you make it earlier. I mean, there's no problem with setting up calls between 9 a.m. Pacific time and 11 a.m. Pacific time, and that's your time when you do calls. So I think it's just a matter of, of, of smart scheduling, but no, it's not, not really a, a problem. No, I agree. Um, my work tends to be more on, on the East Coast. So I have the California problem a little bit less, but I, I schedule phone calls. I, I try to schedule phone calls for morning US time. Um, obviously, sometimes there's emergencies, there's documents that need to get to get turned around. Um, and sometimes you have to work late. But you know what, when I worked in America, there were also times I worked till midnight. So I mean, it's not, it's not crazy. So um, there aren't that many emergencies, where I think where you can't schedule things. And, um, and so you, you plan it in terms of Thursday night to Monday. So sometimes I work on Friday, it's not a work day in Israel, yeah. but sometimes I work on Friday. Sometimes, um, especially in the summertime, if I send a client something late Thursday night or early Friday, I'll say, I'm available from 9 a.m. until 11 a.m. Yeah. Eastern time, you know, Arab Shabbat, and, and that's fine. And, um, and I just tell myself, but you get to live in Israel. So if every once in a while you have to work Arab Shabbos or work too late on a Thursday night, but you got to live in Israel and um, you're not taking it, you know, you're off for all the Hagim. So an hour here or there um, is not, but, but at the same time, you have to, you have to make your schedule. And um, it depends if your clients know where you are. I presume most people's clients know where they are. Um, sometimes with opposing counsel, you may have to be a little bit more flexible if you're not racing to tell them where you're located. But certainly if your own clients know where you are, which I think that they would, um, I think they're generally pretty sensitive also. I don't have a lot of clients who suggest 4 p.m. calls to me in the absence of an emergency because they know where I am. So I don't think that's really such a big deal. Yeah, I would, I mean, I, I agree with both of you. And I, I actually, for for my practice, I, I actually find the timing here somewhat of, a, somewhat, somewhat of an advantage uh, in the sense that we have Sunday to catch up and no one in the States is, you know, really expecting communication then. So for me personally, I work a late night, Thursday night, um, you know, and try to sort of uh, get to close to the end of the U.S. day, you know, so uh, four or five o'clock, whatever it is in the U.S. day. And then for that, which comes afterwards, if I needed, like agreeing with Andrea, if I needed to be online for an hour or two on Friday to answer those questions that are most pertinent, I could. But in the States, everyone knew that Friday was a short day for me anyway, and that I was going to be leaving early. And so I think people knew that the bulk of my value was going to be, you know, provided through Thursday night and less on Friday. And I think the fact that we have Sunday here as a catch up mm -hmm. and frankly, much of our Monday, you know, that Maybe. the ability for us to get back to US clients by their Monday morning, we've already been through two of our work days um, here. And I think that that gives us ample catch-up time. Um, so I, I generally find it to be an advantage. Maybe we'll just take one more question. And then um, I know that uh, all of our contact information has been put in the chat. Again, I would, I would urge all of you who have follow-up questions, want to set up follow-up discussions. This is not meant to be a, a PR discussion. It's much more in a talkless way to just introduce you to uh, briefly to our stories, give you some chizuk thoughts, you know, words, uh, words to be thinking about based on wherever you are in your career and, and essentially to be uh, a helpful resource in any way that we can to help with your decision and, and, and thoughts on career path um, incoming. Um, the last question that I would just 
sort of pick up is, um, you know, do Israeli law firms ever hire or utilize U.S. trained lawyers to assist with transactions, um, you know, to, with perfect English speaking skills, contract drafting skills, including sophisticated or complex agreements? I think we touched upon that, but the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, Israeli firms have become more and more sophisticated. Their clients are doing a lot more in the U.S. They want to be much more involved in what their clients are doing in the U.S., recognizing that they're, that they're limited in terms of the type of guidance that they can provide, uh, uh, Israeli law versus U.S. law. But if they have U.S. lawyers on staff who can help guide uh, transactions, then you know, they can provide a lot more value to their clients than ever was the case. And they will hand it off in many cases to Andrea for labor and employment issues. They might turn it to, to our firm for uh, various issues where they recognize that their expertise runs out. But I'm definitely seeing more and more Israeli firms who are hiring, um, you know, U.S. trained lawyers and, and find a lot of value for them. Yeah, Jack. And there's also, I don't know if they still exist, but there was, there, there have been some outside um, outsource kind of firms that have been hiring U.S. lawyers specifically for the purpose of, of doing the opposite, helping U.S. firms with their discovery and some of the other. Um, out, I think it was called outside counsel. I don't know if they still exist, but I remember them from years ago. Um, but there have been other ones that have popped up that, that, have, that have done exactly that, you know, and that's what they want. They're looking for U.S. licensed lawyers to do that kind of work. So. Right, outside counsel actually became Schwell, uh, Schwell Winfarmer. Oh, really? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. No. That's great. It that's started awesome. that way, but it but it they become so successful and really found the yeah. niche that that's. that's but there, I I don't know the details, but I was at a networking event a couple of years ago, and um and I met a woman and her company. Um, whereas I think we've always been a full service law firm. What her firm was doing was it was just outsourced. I think discovery. Where yeah. they were hiring contractors, yeah. I guess by you know for yeah, hourly right. discovery, and I think that that exists there. I apologize, I don't have the details about that, yeah. but I think that that also that, that also exists. Yeah, yeah, I think there are a few of them. Great. All right. Well, I think we'll 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 wrap it up there. We'll hand it back over to Josh again. Um, Daniel, Jack, Andrea, thank you all for your wonderful insights, for sharing your stories, for sharing uh, you know your your words to. Uh, our, our wonderful audience. And, you know, it's been a real privilege to spend some time with you. And Josh, you know, thanks again to Nefesh Benefesh for all that you do and for providing these great opportunities for Olim, you know, to, to consider their career paths and different ways of, of getting there. And we're certainly here for you and your team as a resource in any way that we can be. So back over to you. Well, thank you all for joining us. Uh, Jeremy, Andrea, Jack, and Daniel, your stories are, I found relatable. Um, you all come from such different perspectives, kind of all have settled into a very um, productive and uh, seemingly meaningful uh, careers here in Israel. Um, I think you know, what we try to do is help people build their Aliyah confidence. And one part of that is to see people that they can relate to in a real and meaningful way, uh, people who came from backgrounds like, like, the, like their own. Um, so I thank all of you for your time, for your experience. Um, thank all of you who joined us today uh, to listen to this session. Um, as Jeremy uh, said, everyone is available um, with the contact, uh, to be contacted you know, with any specific questions that relates to their situations. Um, and uh, thank you all for joining us. And uh, we look forward to uh, continuing to assist you all with your LAI. Have a great day.